Richard mentioned, this is um, something again, it takes us to the present, and and we can talk about the controversy. Well, it's a very controversial topic, and it, and it seems like everybody's so involved in, in, in this uh, in this topic. And uh, every time we say something, again, uh, emotions flare. People have very strong opinions on what's happening. So I'm going to try and tone it down. <laughs> so this work is essentially based on some previous work that Richard and I have done and we published this one article in Social Media's Research called Gravity of Song and Philippines in Addicts of Therapy and Quality of Life Analysis. Uh, and did you change this? No, I didn't change it, did you? I certainly didn't change your PowerPoint. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> so this is the, the, the summary of the paper, um, and it you know one of the things that I just want to point point out is that we did a quality of life an, uh, analysis dealing with a whole bunch of Islamic nations, and some of the indicators that we used uh, the civil liberties index uh, field. Index, um, so again, we're looking at civil liberties index, the failed states index, global terrorism. Index. So these are essentially some of the measures that we use, the indicators, to try and, and correlate them with something that's um, uh, Richard's uh, Social uh, pro Progress Index, which was called the Weighted Index of Social Products, which is uh, the one which is at the very bottom of that slide. And it, it represents, it captures um, quality of life uh, in all countries. And Richard has been doing a fantastic job, you know, keeping track of the quality of life of um, of you know globally, um, and 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 you can really get into that that index. But the next slide is the thing that I wanted to concentrate on, which is when you look at the correlations among these. This is what I want you to focus on. That when we're looking at pairs. And when we're looking at quality of life, look at how sizable this negative correlation is. It's not only significant, but it is sizable. Now, what does that tell us? Tell us that in Islamic countries, those that experience a lower quality of life are likely to experience a high level of terrorism. That's what the correlation is saying. Now, again, we're not getting into the correlate into the causation of this, and the causation of this is this is where we uh, will try to make sense of that correlation. We're making we're trying to make sense of that correlation, and this is of course where. Uh, we get to talk about jihadist terrorism. Now, one of the things, of course, you know, qualify this this whole idea of jihadists is we have a very small minority of Muslims who chose to um, pursue their vision in a very violent way, in a very violent way, and they're creating a, a great deal of chaos um, and. Although, you know, some of that chaos is in Europe and the United States, most of the chaos is in Islamic countries. Most of the chaos is taking place in Islamic countries. So the, the theme of 
this presentation and, and ultimately the paper that we're writing is that we need to understand the, the psychopathology of this. The psychopathology. And we want to do this by trying to figure out exactly what the drivers are. So we want to build on what we've done, and this is what we think is happening. You know, much, much of the conservative Western, I guess may I call them militants too, <laughs> Uh, well, no, may another word would be hawkish. You know, a lot of hawkish Westerners think that what is happening is essentially a cancer among, um, in our midst. And what we need to do is we need to just cut it out, cut it out. And the surgical way of doing it would be through military means. Well, let's go about carpet bomb the son of a blah blah, right? Or um, let's dismantle this military apparatus. And we know how to do this. In economic terms, I mean, essentially what they're doing is they're focusing on the supply side of uh, what you might call the market of jihadists. Um, it, meaning they, they look at the sources of funding, they look at uh, and how, how jihadists are recruited and, and how they conduct their operations and of course counterterrorism measures are um, formulated as a function of knowing how uh, the jihadist organization is set up and therefore supply, the supply kind of economics perspective. Again from an economics perspective, you know, we're missing the other side of the equation. And the other side of the equation is the demand. And we need to ask ourselves, what is attracting the jihadists to the cause? And, and what are the causes? What is driving market demand for the jihadist cause? And you know, that cause this kind of chaos. So we try to analyze this, and, and, and again, the model shows us that there are macro-environmental factors, economic, political, cultural, religious, globalization, media, and other past counter-terrorism actions that have historically, over time, has led to a negative sentiment of aggrieved Muslim, aggrieved. They have a grievance, right? And that, that grievance, that frustration, that resentment, that anger, that, and you can, you, yes, translate it into hate, is possibly causing increase of market demand of the jihadist cause and the terrorist organization taking up the cause. So let's try and further analyze those economic, political, cultural, religious, globalization, media factors and what we're doing in terms of counter-terrorism actions that is feeding, right? That is feeding this negative sentiment and making things worse. Making things worse. This is the model that we came up with. And of course we don't have time to get into the intricacies of this model, but let me just give you an example of some of the major um, dimensions. Let's look at the in economic uh, factors. In Islamic societies, and many of those, income disparities, poverty, and unemployment is very much associated with acts of terrorism. So there's plenty of evidence to suggest that, again, in, in, in societies, in countries that are besieged by income disparities and have a great deal of poverty and unemployment. That is a driver of terrorism. That is a driver of the jihadist militancy. Disparities in technological innovation, those countries that fall behind in terms of being able to uh, deliver uh, in, in terms of those products and services in an innovative way, again, may be another cause that uh, political factors, authoritarian and tribal 
exclusionary regimes. And again, we can talk about well, I, a whole bunch of examples out there, right? Uh, religious factors, uh, increased rel Islamic religiosity. They, you know, it's just amazing. I was born in the Middle East. I was born and raised in Cairo and Beirut. When, I, you know, I, I was born in 1952. And, um, and many years when I went back to the Middle East, I didn't recognize it. I didn't recognize the place that I grew up in. And that is, it is extremely uh, much more Islamic than when I was growing up, when I was being there, uh, when, I, when I was there growing up in my formative years. Um, but it's not just based on my personal experience, but it, it's essentially, it's a, it's, a, it's a documented fact. There is definitely increased Islamic religiosity and definitely the whole idea of secularism is going down the tubes. And again, there's quite a bit of evidence such as that. Um, globalization and media factor. This, this particular factor uh, indicates that, um, that through glo globalization there is a sense of disparity between material wealth uh, between the Islamic countries and uh, other Western countries that is driving, that is essentially making, what uh, accentuating, maybe that's the right word, accentuating the feelings of aggrievement. Uh, and again, there's quite a bit of evidence to suggest that. Cultural factors, and again, Mohsen, uh, Mohsen with, his, with his presentation, which is a very fine presentation, you know, making the distinction between the East and the West, well, actually between the Western and, and Islamic societies, this whole business of decadence. I mean, the, you know, uh, Muslims and Muslim scholars, and, and again, that's very, very indicative, and in, in, in again, in the presentation, they think of... Western, the Western conception of happiness is decadent, decadent, decadent because we're so much involved in hedonic well-being. Well, it's very unfortunate that Islamic scholars dismiss the concept of eudaimonia. And that is a very different, it's a, it's, it's a very different conception of happiness. Philosophers have long documented that the good life is not about pleasure, but Muslim scholars have been fixated on thinking that the Western world is decadent because it's, we're so pleasure-oriented, and that's very unfortunate. And, that, and there's another thing, a cultural fact, which is Western prejudice and discrimination. There are a lot of Muslims that have been discriminated, uh, you know, in the West, uh, whether it's the United States or just literally in, in all over Europe, and that's really accentuating and, and uh, this feeling of aggrievement among Muslims. But most important, most important, if you look at that bottom, bottom uh, box, uh, what we are doing right now, we've been doing for the last 20 something years to combat counterterrorism is feeding terrorism, fueling terrorism. We're barking up the wrong tree. We Muslims have been looking at us and saying, well, you know, Muslims are being tortured. We send our intelligence operatives, and what they do is they torture the heck out of them, right? We have assassinations, and Muslims are looking at us and says, well, they're killing us. You know, with military strike, um, this whole business collateral damage, well, you know, we're going to just kill a few in order to save many. But do you realize that's a public relations disaster? Well, again, the hawkish people in our government, they don't realize this.
How about any efforts to reintegrate former jihadists in civilian life? Are we doing any of that? Heck no. Again, accentuating the problem. So in essence, what we're doing is we are barking up the wrong tree and, what, and we're not addressing those factors that ultimately should address this idea of aggrievement among Muslims, this grievance, this, this frustration, resentment, anger, and hate, and ultimately that cause rise to the jihadist movement. What we need to do, yes, we need to, again, have a very different approach to counterterrorism, a very different approach. It's a quality of life approach. We need to get involved in nation building and, 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 and address those quality of life factors, those drivers that ultimately play a role in the rise of the jihadist movement. Thank you.